All right, folks, it's my experience that the better the guest, the shorter the introduction needs to be because the person's reputation precedes them. But a bloke who played for our club, who went on to become the federal treasurer, has had a stint as our ambassador in Washington. These are extraordinary CV highlights. We'll talk about the rest of the gaps in between. Please welcome Joe Hoggy. Oh, oh. Now, listen, let's start. Before we get into politics and all your experience there, you're here to start with because you're one of our players, you're one of us. Tell me about when you came to the club, what was expected of you? Did you think you were going to be a star? Were you aiming for first grade? And who were the coaches around you and the leading people that bedded you down? Uh, well, I, I started playing second year at university and I was at John's College. And uh, someone said, you must be a prop. Uh, <laughs> I found it very hard to deny. And uh, so started playing third grade Colts. You know, in those days we tended to play in our dinner suits from the night before and, uh, and uh, then went up the grades and then played uh, in the grades, third grade mainly, second grade the occasional game, occasional game first grade. And I loved it, what a great club. And uh, you know I was just uh, hearing a great story about Trilogy, I just want to also pay tribute to everyone that has been there through thick and thin. I was there when we went down to second division. Maybe I contributed to that. Uh, but, um, you know, the way the club just came together was just, it, it defined the club. And uh, all the ex-players ring you up saying, can you, you know, you've got to donate. You haven't got a choice. And, and the way uh, Andrew Wennerbaum and David Mortimer and Bill Corp, I don't know if there's anyone here from Bill Corp. What a, a mate. There you are. I mean, what an amazing sponsor, like. You know, that's, that's the very definition of loyalty and, and uh, you know, the club has just, it's exceeded expectations but in many ways met expectations. Now can you guys at the back here, okay, because Joe's, he's got a great, great projection. Listen, I remember being playing lower grades at university and a coach shouting at me and he used the word soft and he used the word skills but there were lots of other words in between. There were many words. I'm trying, to, uh, I'm trying to find out from you whether the being able to move in political circles, whether you learn things, the networks that you get at a rugby club and the way people react and treat each other in a rugby club, does that help you push forward into those other parts of life? Look, there's no better sport to play than rugby. I mean, it just it brings you together. It's shared experience. I'm a team player. It teaches you loyalty teaches you that the real benefit of hard work is, is you know, comes at the end of the season. Uh, and you make lifelong friendships. Um, you know, I first met Tony Abbott when he was coaching second grade and wouldn't pick me into second grade. And, um, and, uh, uh, and uh, you know, the, the characters you met. And I first met Nick Farr Jones, Peter Fitzsimons, Damien Frawley, names that you're familiar with, a number of people here, Brad Pillinger. You know, and, and Roger Davis, I mean, it goes on and on. Like, plenty of great people that I consider mates for life. But did you learn things from those guys? Did you learn things? No. <laughs> <laughs> Let's not embellish it, mate. I mean, it was a good mates. But... Of all the names you just mentioned, who did you learn the least from? <laughs> well, <t> <laughs> I'll learn well let's come back to Tony, Tony very <laughs> briefly. Because Tony, on paper, Tony should be your mentor. He's a few years ahead of you. He's gone into the same side of politics. You've played on the same part of the scrum. To what extent was he remotely interested in helping you in your political so career? So it is a rather famous story. Everyone has probably heard it. I don't know if I need to repeat it, but um, he was captain coach of second grade and I was in third grade. And the coach of first grade, I think at the time Steve Anthony, was, he was picking me for the occasional first grade game he couldn't understand why I was in second grade. This guy, Tony Abbott, he just had something against me. And uh, we were at training and his prop had gone down and he decided to fill in at, at, uh, at loose head. And I was tight head. And he said, well, we'll have some scrums and then we'll follow up with a ruck or a maul. And uh, I thought, this is my chance. So we packed a scrum. I lifted him a bit, pushed him back, he didn't like that. And then he lied over the ball in the subsequent ruck. And I went straight into his kidneys with my shoulder. And he screamed like, you know, a kitten. And, uh, and I thought, oh, well done, Joe, that'll take him out. 
Uh, what I didn't know was he was an Oxford boxer, and he got up and he smashed me, and I was gone. <laughs> and the next thing, the next thing, I woke up in the change room, and he's standing over me, going, "Mate, mate, I'm so sorry, mate. I don't know what I did. Like, I lost my temper." Oh, well, okay. And then I ended up his treasurer. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's very important, the next one of these events, we get Tony's version of that story. No, it's no different, I can tell you, it's no different. Yeah. <laughs> now, tell us about when you came in to get the seat of North Sydney, Ted Mack had been there forever, you couldn't have anticipated that he would suddenly retire and that seat would become vacant. It's a bit Stephen Bradbury, if you don't mind me saying uh, so. Well, I do, because okay. it wasn't. Well, Steve Bra Stephen Bradbury's view would be, he won at fair and square, I know it's his view, so. <laughs> It's my view too. No, Ted Mack, uh, Ted Mack formed the view. Well, I, I decided to run. I was only 26, so I'd been a lawyer and worked just a short period of time. But I just, for various reasons, I felt I really wanted to get involved in politics. Uh, it was my local area, and I'd met a lot of people. I was involved in the privatisation of the GIO and the State Bank, and made these great connections and had a lot of friends. Everyone just came behind me because they thought North Sydney should go back to the Liberal Party, but <clears throat> people didn't think they could beat Ted Mack. And then I just ran a really hard campaign and he decided not to run. And, um, and he said to me, he said, independence just can't make a difference in Canberra. And he's absolutely right. And, uh, you know, I hope, I hope that the same happens again, that people realise that you've got to be part of a team. You've got to be part of a team in Canberra. You can't run foreign policy or defence policy by committee. You've actually got to, you can't run the economy by committee. People need to have the courage to make hard and unpopular decisions. And whether, you know, I'd much rather, I said it before the last election, I would much rather have the Labor Party in government than the Liberal Party in minority. And it's the same today. Uh, you know, I'm really glad for Albanese, he has a majority. Okay, tell us about the, the idea that people get point, appointed to places like Washington as ambassadors or high commissioners to London, whether those people should be career diplomats, when does it make sense for a career diplomat to become a diplomat at that level, and when does it make sense for a former politician to become a senior diplomat in those big key postings? Well, every country's different. Um, really, you'd send your career diplomats to Pakistan or Sri Lanka or... Uh, or Thailand or whatever, right? But you don't... All the spicy countries. Yeah, well, <laughs> well, India, they sent Barry O'Farrell, did a great job. But, um, but career diplomats are treated as, as, you know, public servants. And in Washington, as a former... I mean, Washington has always been traditional. If you miss out on being prime minister, you go there. Kim Beasley went there. Kevin Rudd got promoted back to, <laughs> to be ambassador. But... Others, that was the traditional way it has always been. And uh, Andrew Peacock and so on. And you, you, when you walk into Congress and meet congressmen and women and senators, they respect you because you've been to an election. You know what it's like. You know the challenges they've got. And you've also, Washington is the most competitive place on earth. And there's no, it's the modern Rome. And if you can't, you've got to have the bravado and I, chaired the G20 in 2014, so I knew Obama and Janet Yellen and all these people, I was able to say, no, actually, I want to see the President, or I want to see the Vice President, or the Secretary of Treasury, and you can't do that as a public servant, and, you know, particularly as a, a Deputy Secretary or Assistant Secretary in the Department, you're not going to get anywhere. So access is everything. Access matters in London, access matters in Washington, it will increasingly be the case in Beijing. China's very hierarchical. Japan, it matters. Um, a handful of other countries, yeah. I, I don't know how many people here have read, written, written, read stuff written by Peggy Noonan, who used to work for Reagan. But she said when Reagan became governor of California, he, he and Nancy were very surprised. They had to buy their own food. They didn't realise they got given this house. Oh, yeah. But yeah. then it was one of them. Tell us about taking up the residency of the Australian ambassador in Washington and what that means on a day-to-day, -day, Monday to Friday basis for you and your family. Well, I never wanted to be ambassador. I wanted to be prime minister. And I lost the vote by one to Malcolm Turnbull, uh, well, and then Tony Abbott. But, and you look, when Malcolm Turnbull knocked off Tony Abbott, 
he said, you can be anything you want, you just can't be treasurer, I promise that to Morrison. And I said, well, screw that. Um, I'll, I'll, I'm out of here, I don't, otherwise I'll be a cancer. C can I just told you, that, uh, that you've summarised those conversations into a couple of sentences, but was this something that took days and weeks and no, lots of no, meetings? No, no, or no. How does it actually wash well, out? He, he announced the challenge to Abbott on the Sunday, the vote was, from memory, the Monday or the Tuesday, and, you know, uh, and Abbott lost. And then he wanted me to finish the week as treasurer because he didn't want another treasurer in question time and he didn't have a ministry. And uh, during that week he asked me, you know, what do you want to do? You can be minister for defence, you can be... And I've been 20 years. I've been a minister front bencher for 17 years. 17 years. I've been minister, you know, a range of different things. Either you get the top job or you don't. And I just said, well, I've given it my best shot as treasurer and, uh, you know, I'm done. I, I, I've got nothing more to give. And um, he said, well, you know, you can have any job in the world. And I, at that stage, I really wanted to get out of Australia for a bit, but I didn't want to stop serving. And so um, uh, he said, do you want to go to Washington? And I spoke to Melissa that night and... Uh, and said, yeah, and look, it was a very hard decision because, you know, it's, it's sort of, it's akin to, you know, Tom Hanks in Apollo 13 watching the moon pass, right? It's like, you know, it was the hardest moment of my political career was sitting surrounded by boxes in my parliament office signing my resignation letter from parliament. Hard. Let's come back to you get there. Who helps you understand oh, the lay of the they, land, mate, who they, helps you understand so how they put you actually... So they put you on a training course and I told them, you know, ridiculous stuff and at uh, DFAT and I said, no, I'm not doing that. I just chaired the G20. I met all the presidents, everyone, from Putin and Obama right through. So we're not going to do that. Um, but then... Uh, and was that appreciated, your resistance yeah, on that? Yeah, I had a great deal of bravado at that time. And then... Um, uh, but then you arrive and you're basically the Prime Minister of... Australia in the US. So we had, um, at that time, uh, you know, we, we had missions all through the US. You are personally liable for the welfare of every staff member and their families under ridiculous laws. We had uh, 3,000 personnel in, uh, in 32 states of the US. And a lot of them military folk, but also in the embassy itself in Washington, you've got about 430 people um, and you've got a lot of intelligence and you see all the intelligence. You see, I saw more intelligence from the US and others as ambassador than I saw as treasurer and the National Security Committee. So there's almost, is there a higher level of clearance than what you had as yours the absolute top well, shelf? It's, it's, you can, yeah, I mean, absolute top, yeah, yeah. As ambassador, you go to places that are Inconceivable, you didn't know existed. Well, we'll, we'll have that conversation off microphone. <laughs> People are fascinated by... And, and when you get there, sorry, you get there and they lay it on. I mean, the ambassadors, you know, um, you've got a house that's on five acres in the middle of DC. It was George Patton's house many years ago. You've got six staff, you've got everyone. And, it, and it, you, it's basically a big RSL. I mean, you, you know... <laughs> You've got people living in the house. I, I had, you know, I have, still have, <laughs> thank God, wife of three children. And, you know, we brought a, my wife was working, she was a company director and numerous things. We brought our nanny over, we brought two dogs, a cat, you know, just went on. And, and then you, you, people are living in your house. And it sounds great, uh, and it is great for a while, but if you're doing events downstairs every night, and uh, it, it, it does become, pretty exhausting. In normal terms, three years. I was asked to do four years and then I said enough. The, the other thing about Ronald Reagan, the same observation made about him as president, he was used to, as an actor, just being given a schedule. Here, Mr. President, here's your day. Yeah. Did you determine your own day or yeah. were other people yeah. handing you a day? Yeah, they weekend? tried. Yeah, and it didn't work. I mean, I, uh, I, I, I was there to be different. I wasn't there to be traditional Department of Foreign Affairs ambassador, I was there to be different. And I started being different. I said, well, why, you know, we're right into the first year, the last year of Obama, and 
I was people saying, well, you know, it's going to be Hillary. Hillary's going to win and she's going to uh, probably take on Jeb Bush. I said, look, you know, who's telling you that? Oh, Washington. And all the experts and they'd have all the pollsters in. And I said, no, no. I said, I've got to get out. So went out to Detroit and started to go out to, to you know, um, Screw Knuckle Creek, Idaho and various places. <laughs> and found that it was all a bit different. There was a lot of angry people out there and they wanted a voice. And uh, so you've got a congressional team of eight people that are constantly engaging on the Hill and monitoring things. I sent them out. I said, do not go to any capital cities. I want you to go out to the Midwest. I want you to go to towns that you've never heard of and get the pulse. And they came back and went, wow, they're pretty angry out there. I said, okay, let's feed it in. Why is it important for you as the Australian ambassador to the United States to have a good prediction of election outcomes? Well, it's not easy, but you've got to get to know both sides. And as it progressed, Trump was coming through the field and I was marrying that with the anger and marrying that with intelligence I was picking up from others and I went, something's happening here. And, uh, uh, so I said we're going to re we'd already reached out to Hillary Clinton's campaign and it was very organised, sophisticated and all that sort of stuff based in New York City and Trump's campaign was disorganised, no one knew who was running it and I said I'm reaching out and Canberra went crazy. They said don't go near him, he's toxic, he's not going to win. I said actually I think he might and they're going what would you know, you've just arrived and I, so I ignored them not for the first time, and reached out. And thank God we did. T tell me about, I know a lot of people are fascinated and, and John mentioned it as well, but we're looking down the barrel on current projections, a couple of very old men with, each of them have rather dodgy networks, shall we say, and depends who you ask how dodgy each of those networks is or connections, but neither of them is, is lily white and untainted by various scandals and yet the silver medal candidate in both sides seems to be 50 metres behind them. Can you restore our confidence that two impressive candidates might find their way to the line, might find their way to the grand final over the next 18 months? It's a hell of a system, the American system. I mean, it sorts people out on a range of different factors. Firstly, money, you know, it's big and, uh, and you know, Biden's out fundraising Trump two to one at the moment. And Trump's spending all the money he's raising on legal fees. So that's got a long way to go. The second thing is, and I need to check this, um, you've just reminded me, I can't remember when there were the two candidates from the Republicans and the Democrats, two consecutive elections in a row. I can't, I, like I seriously, you go back. Well, not I, since World War II, definitely. Yeah, I mean, it goes, I, I really need to check that fact, but um, it, it's, I, I think it's highly unlikely that it'll be Biden, Trump, Trump, Biden. Just highly based unlikely. on, because there's no form line for it? Well, because it's such a long process to get there. I mean, we don't have the first, we have the first debate coming up in the next month uh, in the Republican Party. Uh, you know, we can go through both sides. You know, let's start with Joe Biden. He's the incumbent. Uh, he has a uh, Kamala Harris, if he's not the candidate, Kamala Harris will be the candidate. Uh, the most influential cohort in Democrat primaries is black women. And of course it's voluntary voting and they, uh, you know, uh, Congressman Clyburn, he was the decision maker in Joe Biden becoming the Democrat nominee. He's in South Carolina. Uh, he is a you know, a, a highly respected leader of the black community, long time, uh, you know, he was, I think he was there on the bridge with Martin Luther King. He is, he is quite the legend and he basically, by bringing the black vote behind Biden, decided that Biden would be uh, the This is the John candidate. Lewis or? No, 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 this is John Lewis. Uh, Congressman uh, Jim Clyburn. Okay. And, uh, and uh, anyway, he, um, he said, you're going to have a, a black female candidate as your running mate. And Biden did. Now, he might deny that, but that's the reality. And, uh, and so 
the only way, you know, and what happens is you get into the presidency and if the pres no president really gets on with their vice president, right? They really trash them usually. And this isn't any different because if Kamala Harris was looking really good now, everyone would be saying, Joe, you've got to go, right? So what they do is they usually end up, their White House ends up trashing their own vice president to make sure there is no competition to the president. And uh, so that's effectively happened with Kamala Harris. So the only option would be to switch her out for Stacey Abrams, who comes from uh, um, Georgia, I think it was. And anyway, so I don't think that's going to happen. Um, Joe Biden's, interestingly enough, his re-election committee hasn't really started up and running, which is quite late. Um, and there's just a feeling that, you know, he might not run. Don't forget, you know, Lyndon Johnson pulled out after three primaries, which opened the door for Kennedy and others. So, you know, it, it, it's still early days in the Democrats. In the Republicans, Trump's yards ahead. Um, and there's a few others that are actually really good in the field. Chris Christie is really, you know, if you want late night entertainment, look at Chris Christie talking about Trump on YouTube or CNN, whatever it is. He is murdering Trump's reputation. Uh, he's, and I've got friends who are feeding him what drives Donald Trump nuts. <laughs> and one of them is Melania has changed her name by deed poll to Kushner. So Christie keeps talking of, uh, not Melania, Ivanka. Ivanka, Ivanka Kushner. Ivanka Kushner, he keeps saying. Every time he says it, you know, Trump's blood would be going like crazy. And, uh, and, you know, a whole range of things. He behaves like a child. So Chris Christie's thinking is, OK, Trump has 45% of the vote of the Republican primary, but 55% don't want him. So what I'm going to do is basically work over that 55%. If it's not for me, it might be DeSantis or someone else that's going to benefit. But I've got to stop Trump. And Christie's also been to over 100 Bruce Springsteen concerts. So. Oh, well, there you go. I didn't know that. These are I, don't, I don't think Chris Christie will get there, but he sent me a text the other day with the latest polls in New Hampshire, and, it, you know, he's, he's coming second. For those of us who haven't been in the political process like you have, would you direct us to any movies, books, TV series, works of fiction or non-fiction, which, which you think have been the best insight, whether it's, you know... Um, Yes, Minister, or the thick of it, or you know, these well, sorts yes, of things. Yes, Minister was always a documentary for us. I mean, it wasn't a British comedy. I mean, it was so close to the truth, it was uncanny. Um, well, you can read my book, Diplomatic, thirty-four ninety-five from HarperCollins. Is it, that's still the and price. And it's on audio book. It took me 14 hours. It's easy. And it, it actually gives you the best insight. It's easy read. Um, <laughs> Uh, they've stopped paying me. You didn't bring any so. with you. You didn't bring no, a no, box of books. But if Fitz Simons would have him. bought a box of books with you. I know, he would have signed them all too yeah. so they can't be returned. But, yeah. the, um, <laughs> but, but it's actually, it's a really easy to read from an Australian perspective on, um, on uh, you know, I go through the whole primary process and the media and debates. Uh, you know, there's a whole lot of others. Uh, but no, there, there's no one book that's, because everyone's coming from an angle. And, uh, you know, I, I tried not to come from an angle. I tried to take it as an outside observer. You know, and, and just to give you an indication. Um, so before the last election, the Australian asked me to write a series of columns. And in federal politics, we have our equivalent of Betty Bankstown. We call her the swing, the marginal seat voter. Um, and she lives in Bankstown, you know, working mum, uh, works at Woolies, etc., etc. And, you know, she would probably not indicate the way she was going to vote and just go in there and basically she decided the election with Morrison and, and Albanese. So the picture that I created was Mary Milwaukee. And Mary Milwaukee is a mum uh, in her uh, late 40s, early 50s earning $14 an hour for most of her later years in, at, at Walmart. She has two children, a, a son who's done three tours of duty in Afghanistan, a daughter that she hopes one day might get to college, but she can't afford it. 
Her husband is one of three million white truck drivers in America, uh, earning day to day, fearful of automation. Uh, she goes to church twice a week, a lot of people in the Midwest do. Um, and her father might have been a coal miner in West Virginia. And you know what? She got sick of people telling her to feel guilty about her life, about what she believed in, what she thought marriage was, about making her feel like she was a failure because she didn't go to university. She never had a pay increase. She watched late night TV where people in Hollywood and New York were laughing at her. She was called deplorable by Hillary. And she's going, actually, I'm voting for Trump over Hillary. And a majority of white women voted for Trump over Hillary in America. Get that. A majority of white women voted for Trump ahead of Hillary Clinton. And, and, they, and they, you know, she doesn't like his behaviour, his language, the way he treats people. He, she doesn't, but he speaks for me. When he says, actually, there's nothing wrong with going to church, I don't care that he doesn't go to church, but he's speaking for me. All the things that I want to say. I'm sick of seeing people dying of drug overdoses on the streets. This is, this is exactly what Trump is doing again. And did Biden and get most of those women he back? He got them back. And you know why? Because Trump uh, basically uh, somehow, I watched it in DC, I was there. He managed to turn the whole tragedy of COVID into a story about him rather than about Mary Milwaukee and protecting her. And I think there were moments like where he told people to go and inject themselves with detergent. And this sort of crap, that was where he lost Mary Milwaukee. I think the tipping point was when he came out of hospital and he was in the car with his security guys and just to wave to his supporters and he had COVID. That was when she said enough. And I could feel it just talking to people. I could feel it because he was more concerned about himself than he was about Mary Milwaukee and the security and health of her family. Let's come back to Australia. If you, in theory, had launched a campaign to enshrine an Indigenous voice in the Parliament, how would you have gone about it compared to the way that Albanese's gone oh, about he, it? He just had to provide the details as a starting point. You can't leave people, you can't leave people wondering. They just won't. And, and the second thing is, and you know, I understand where he's coming from. I understand the issue, you know, I think very well. I've got to tell you, I just get nervous about anything based on race, positive or negative. I think tolerance, you can't legislate tolerance. You've got, to, you've got to create it and then you confirm it by legislation. And the fact that South Australia said they're legislating a voice, they legislated, the Labor government legislated it, but didn't want to go as far as putting it into their constitution, proves to me that it's a step too far. You remember, we had a referendum on this in 1999 to, to put it in. Now, well, the words might not have been great, but the fact was it was recognition, proper recognition of Indigenous Australians in 1999, because there were two questions, a republic and constitutional recognition of Indigenous Australians. The republic got 5% more votes than the recognition of Indigenous Australians. So more people voted for the republic than voted for that. And that was, in part, a failure for us to win over the people. That wasn't Peter Fitzsimons. No, it wasn't. No, it was... It was uh, um, Malcolm. No, no. no. And, 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 and so, on this occasion, you know, I, I just, I'm fearful of anything that locks in race-based relations. And it's not that it wouldn't give Indigenous Australians more of a voice. It's the, it's the reaction over time that is what concerns me. It will create a, an embedded division in Australia and there will be, you know, there will be bigots and racists always, but it'll just, it'll become a, a, a perceived, lightning pole. Perceived division. Uh, yeah, well, it'll become a lightning rod for people to create racial division in Australia and I, I just don't agree with it. Now, when I do a lot of rugby and cricket and sports interviews, I end up with a question about people who you've played with and against. This is not a football or cricket interview, it's a politics interview. The most gifted politician you ever worked with? Oh, John Howard. Why? 
Uh, he was consultative, smart, real history, very experienced. I mean, he is globally, you know, and I, he, I didn't, he, he, he promoted me ahead of time. He, he shuffled me around. I mean, he was, he was tough on me. I was like the black sheep. And when I took the Queen's head off a $5 note, he, he reacted badly. But, um, but uh, you know, he is, he is the, the wow factor. I mean, it was, I think, the GST and tax reform and so much of what we did. And I was, in his, I was proud to be in his cabinet. And the politician whose self-worth was grossly in excess of his actual abilities oh, and talents. That's a big pull. <laughs> On that note, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, this. I've got to allow him to be a politician. Yeah, no, I, I mean, it, you know, I've had the honour of meeting all sorts of people. I mean, um, uh, you know, the Prime Minister of India is hugely impressive. Angela Merkel, very impressive. Emmanuel Macron, unimpressive. Uh, Putin, evil. Um, uh, you know, Bill Clinton. Played golf with Bill Clinton a couple of times. He is everything you expect. Charming, you know, engaging, humorous. Talks and talks and talks. Like, suppose me. Um, Obama, officious. George H.W. Bush, one of the most honorable men, but very old when I met him. George W. Bush, just such, the Bushes are the most impressive political family globally, I would argue. Um, you know, the Queen, what an impressive woman she was. Uh, British Prime Ministers, mixed bag. <laughs> uh, You've answered a very different question, but it's, it, it, it occurs to me the number of people you've met could be another forum, another forum after that. We could yeah, be here yeah. for some time. And finally, finally, I played cricket at Sydney University with Imran Khan. Right. He shot himself in the foot. Finally, you've played your trump card. Yeah. Folks, <laughs> it's been my absolute privilege and challenge and chore and a pleasure to talk to Joe. I can tell by the attention span of the room that every well, word he's said has been valued by the, you and the audience. So thank you so much and please thank Joe one more time. <laughs>